Good, good morning, folks. Good morning. Uh, good morning, folks. We'll go ahead and get started because I, uh, we have a really exciting agenda planned for you today, and I don't want you to miss out on any of the sessions. I'm Noelle Cockett. I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost for Utah State, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first ever uh, Teaching Technologies Workshop. And we've uh, named today's workshop Empowering Teaching Excellence Conference. Um, so we're very, very pleased to see this amazing turnout. Um, it is a new idea that we've come up with um, to bring uh, best practices, new innovations, technologies to those of you that are contributing to our teaching at Utah State University. And as you know, we are very, very serious about the educational program that we have at USU. And so any way that we can help you folks make your job easier, uh, allow you to implement technologies that improve your curriculum, uh, whatever it is, that we can do to give you the tools uh, to better educate our students. We are eager to do that. Now, for some of you folks, if uh, you had been at USU and were at regional campuses or Eastern, this actually would have been the RCDE Eastern retreat here on campus. But to me, as I've moved into the provost role, to me, that seemed an artificial designation. I do not consider RC regional campus and Eastern faculty different in some way uh, from our Logan-based faculty. We all belong to departments, which belong to colleges, and so we want all of our people to consider going to the department and college retreats that are scheduled later in this week. So once we realized that maybe this artificial designation of regional campus and Eastern faculty versus Logan faculty, we said, well, what is that common thread that so many of our faculty have? Well, of course, it's teaching assignments. For some of you, that's a minor part of your overall role as a faculty. For others, that's the major assignments. For others, that is the assignment that you have at USU. And like I said, we are eager to give you tools, technologies, and best practices that can improve your uh, experiences in the classroom. Um, I want to give special recognition to two individuals who have been very key in the planning of this. First, there's Robert Wagner. Um, many of you are very familiar with Robert. He's been uh, with the Regional Campus and Distance Education Unit for several years. Recently, I asked him to take on a different role. Um, he will still be engaged with the RC uh, and DE programs. Uh, but we are doing a little bit of reshaping of that. And now Robert is our executive vice president and dean for a unit that we call Academic and Instructional Services, AIS. And this is what we used to refer to as distance education. But as you um, are in your classroom, you know that the things that were under distance education are not restricted to something that happens at a distance, either from Logan or from our regional campuses in Eastern. It's a type of delivery method, online broadcast and face-to-face. -face. So we have uh, moved um, things that were under the DE side under this new uh, structure of the AIS, and Robert is the lead on that. So one of the first things that we talked about is how to provide, as I said, innovations on the academic and teaching side of the university. And therefore, Robert, along with John Louvier, another name that I hope is familiar to you, uh, John is the director of City, now I'm gonna, I was trying to avoid them because I might have my acronyms wrong, Center for Instructional Design and Innovation. 
Oh, so flip those two words, the two I words, and you got it. Okay. And the uh, city has been established for several years. John Louvier is the person that's making it possible for you to use Canvas, online, Aquella, I'm not sure what else. I'm not even going to try to name those other things. And uh, so Robert and John have taken a lead on designing this conference. Now, one of the things that we want to do with, oh, it just did it. Um, kicking off our conference is bringing in a keynote speaker. And uh, we wanted someone that has lots and lots of experiences in bringing new innovations to uh, the educational side of a university. And so John suggested a great colleague of his, Dr. Margaret Cozens. Now, um, I have Margaret's bio here, and I'd like to take a few minutes to read it because I think you'll understand why we've asked her to provide the keynote talk. Uh, Dr. Margaret Cousins currently teaches in the math department at Rutgers University and is the PI and grants project manager at the Center for Discrete Mathematics and Theoretical Computer Science at Rutgers, which was founded by uh, NSF Science and Technology Center. Dr. Cousins has also worked in a variety of other notable capacities, such as visiting scholar at Harvard, division director at NSF, good person to know, I'm thinking, chairperson of the mathematics department at Northwest University, vice chancellor at the University of Colorado Health Sciences, CEO of the Colorado Institution of Technology, and Associate's Director of the Knoll Science Teaching Foundation. As I'm reading that, I'm reflecting, for those of you guys that know me, that sounds like a list of things that sometimes I get read on my CV. Lots of different administrative experience. Dr. Cousins, more commonly known as Midge, and she has requested that uh, she be called Midge, has authored 51 articles and 10 books, and has been awarded 10 multi-year research grants from federal agencies including NSF, Department of Homeland Security, and the Office of Naval Research. Through Dr. Cousins' multifaceted involvement and leadership in multiple agencies, she has truly been a catalyst for innovation and change in education. Her successful leadership has brought together state and federal government agencies, industry, and education with a focus on successfully preparing a 21 of 21st century workforce. So I think uh, as you listen to that, you can see why we have asked Midge to join us today and provide, uh, provide us with the kickoff of uh, our first annual teaching conference. Um, so I'm going to invite Midge to come up and uh, present her, um, her keynote speech. I do need to say that I need to leave. Um, and so I'm going to um, exit. But both Robert and I hope to be back throughout the day um, and see how things are going. Now, in addition to participating actively in today's conference, we also are going to ask you for feedback on it. And given that this is our first, uh, we would like to make sub subsequent conferences even better. So your feedback is very, very valuable. And I just want to close and say, have a great day. So thanks, you guys. Thank you very much for the invitation to come to Utah State. I was trying to count up on the plane yesterday how many universities and colleges in the United States that I have visited. And I have visited at least one in every state now because I hadn't visited one in Utah before this. I've been to snowbird skiing, but I'd never been to a university in Utah. Um, I got past 200 and gave up because as you noticed from the summary of my career, and it always makes me feel even older when I hear that litany of what I've done, <laughs> um, which I am, and which is probably why I bring as much experience to the fore. But it, 
it says what you can do when you are committed to educating young people, whether they be kindergarten, whether they be preschoolers, whether they be high schoolers, whether they be the traditional students in colleges, which used to be 17 to about 20, or whether you're talking about the non-traditional uh, students who have gone back to school to either finish a degree or get a degree or simply have become lifelong learners. So as I go through my talk, I can see some of you will relate to some of the dates that I'm talking about. But when I think back, I graduated from the University of Rochester in 1962. That's a long time ago. The only computer science courses in, a co in the university curriculum was a numerical analysis computer course they, taught by the math department because they didn't have such a thing as a computer science department or curriculum or anything else. And it was held at the hospital. And it, Rochester has a, a college campus, and then there are railroad tracks and a field between the, the main campus and the hospital campus. The reason it was held at the hospital campus is it was the only place where there was a building large enough to house the computer that had to be refrigerated effectively. <laughs> Anybody remember that in <laughs> those days? Yeah. And so, and luckily in those days we didn't worry about safety quite as much as we do now because it was of course a night class <laughs> and I'm coming back across the railroad tracks <laughs> having taken that course. Now, of course, they've built all kinds of systems for going between the two campuses and <laughs> they have guards the whole way, but it shows how much things have changed in those 50 some odd years. Another part of my background that some people know and some people don't is after graduating from the University of Rochester, I taught high school math, which was my original goal. I wanted to be a math teacher, arithmetic teacher from the time I was very young, and I taught for a year at Greece Olympia High School, a suburban school outside of Rochester. And in the spring of that year, the Uni SUNY, State University of New York, at Geneseo called me and said, would you consider being an instructor at the State University College, as it's now called, at Geneseo? It was then called Geneseo State. And I said, but I don't even have a master's degree. And they said, well, a bachelor's degree from Rochester is probably heavier in math content than a master's from our sister institutions. Not a very nice thing to say, probably. But <laughs> and I said, well, if you want me, OK. So I taught at Geneseo, no master's degree or anything, for two years as an instructor with a six-course teaching load each semester. Now that didn't seem unusual to a high school teacher <laughs> because that's what you did. <laughs> so I never realized how onerous it was <laughs> to be teaching a six course teaching load. But I realized that if I wanted to stay in college teaching, I had to go to graduate school. And I went to Rutgers University and first got my master's degree and then was encouraged to get my PhD. So, but you know, nowadays, even with a PhD, from very good universities, young people have a hard time getting a teaching job in a college. So here I did it with a bachelor's degree, and now with a PhD you can't. So many things have changed. I'm going to talk about some of the historical background. In other words, what has happened since basically 1960 that has changed the scene of higher education so dramatically in this country and I'll include demographic students, you know, goals, technology, and things like that. Then I'll talk about what opportunities are presenting themselves along with the challenges. And then lastly, of course, what can you do? I probably should say, what can we all do? Because I'm still immersed. As I've said to many people when they say, why don't you retire? 
my younger brothers have and so forth. I fail miserably at retirement. I tried when I left Colorado and it didn't last almost days. So, so I, as long as I can be effective, as long as I can do what I want to do and what I love to do, I'm going to continue. But let's look at that time period because when you think about it, even having been part of the 60, say from 60 to 1980 or the 60s and 70s, what I remembered most about it, of course, is the Vietnam War and changes that occurred in this country as a result of that. But that was the time when there was enormous change in federal policy with regards to higher education. And in particular, the Higher Education Act of 1965 made all the difference in the world as far as who could actually go to college. It was in 1965 where need-based financial assistance was available to the general population. And you might say, what was it before that? Well, before that, it, you had to, it, there was need-based financial aid, but you literally had to be you know, the best and the brightest in those days, the top of your classes. Students who might want to go to college but who weren't straight-A students or so forth, were not eligible for aid. So it was both merit and need-based aid prior to 1965. And that came about because of dramatic changes in the view of higher education. Up until that point, higher education was also viewed to be for the very few. But it was during the 60s when the country basically recognized that higher education, much like K-12 education, should be, could be available for everyone who had the um, skills, the drive to go to college, not just the elite top or the elite top whose parents for generations had gone to school. It was also the time when they advocated open admissions policy. And open admissions in, in the late 60s meant not every university had open admissions, but many universities, and particularly state universities, those that were you know, subsidized by political entities, had open admissions policies. You still had to apply, because then they had to place you. Okay. And during that time period, Enrollments jumped, total enrollment in higher education, private and public, and I'll show you a chart in a few minutes, went from a little over 400,000 students to a little over 800,000 students. So during that period of time, enrollment doubled. Well, let's jump to 1980 and see what changes took place. Because 1980 is still, what, 34 years ago. I mean, it's still a while back. The big change beginning in 1980 was the enormous growth in non-traditional students. And that was coupled with a number of other things like the community college um, development. There were junior colleges or two-year colleges, most of which were private. But community colleges came in, into being the earliest in the early 80s and then increased among states rapidly, actually, up until about 2000. There have been very few new ones added recently, but even you will see where in states where populations have increased dramatically the development of a new community college. The, and so that community college surge uh, increased the ability of non-traditional students to get an education. And again, admissions was more of an open admissions policy. It allowed students to cons be considered as not full-time, even though a university today has part-time students. It still was not the norm, but the community colleges accepted students part-time um, so that mothers could go back after their kids were in school full-time and take courses. People could improve their um, 
position in their jobs by taking courses. And of course, we know that non-traditional students began to um, become enormously important uh, in the latter part of that time period to master's programs, in particular MBA type programs. So, But it also was a time where the ethnic diversity on college campuses changed rather dramatically, but mostly on the community college campuses. So that there was a disproportionate number of blacks, Hispanics, and women at community colleges. An interesting piece is that the rate of degree completion, namely how many actually start out as full-time students and then complete their degree, that has remained unchanged since the early 60s, which is kind of surprising because you, they t and by degree completion they mean if they went to a two-year college for an associate degree, they get the associate degree. But if they went to a four-year college, they got the bachelor's degree. What has changed is it takes longer to get the degree. <laughs> okay. So, but the rate of degree completion has basically remained nationwide unchanged. Let me just show one chart and I'll come back to the next slide. But in terms of the enrollment, you'll notice the data that I was giving you. It doubled in this, up until about 1971, namely from 400,000 to 800,000. Then it doubled again to 2,000, up to 1.6 million. That's a huge shift in enrollment. And part of what that huge influx of students means is that admission standards are obviously going to be somewhat different than they were back in 1960 when very few students went to college, relatively speaking. And so many times faculty, and I've taught math departments, I've been chair of the math department at Northeastern University in Boston, and math departments are great faculty, are great at saying, oh, the students don't know what you know, they don't know algebra, they don't know what they're doing, and I can't teach calculus to students who have such poor backgrounds. Yeah. Well, some of it is probably true. <laughs> some of it probably can be blamed on the K-12 system. But some of it is simply the number of students coming to college. I mean, when you're used to take only students that got A's in three years of high school math, and now we're taking students that got C's in high school math, coupled with a bad word, grade inflation, and grade inflation is rampant in high schools. On many college campuses, it's also rampant. But in the K-12 sector, particularly in the better school systems, grade inflation has grown by leaps and bounds because teachers can't deal with a parent that screams that their kid didn't get you know, the grade that they were supposed to have gotten on a particular test. Mind you, he got a 60 and you gave him a C, but they think their student should get an A, <laughs> even though they got the 60. So grade inflation in high schools means that the kids coming to college don't have as much of a background. And so a lot of things have changed to create this dynamic in college classrooms. And unfortunately also, you see faculty who have gone on and gotten PhDs and so forth remembering how they were taught and thinking you know, that this is the way these young people respond to it these days. And we'll say more about that later on. What happened since 2000? We're now 14 years beyond that point, so we're almost in another 20-year time frame. Huge expansion in for-profit universities. Huge expansion. University of Phoenix was 117,000 in 2005, but I understand it's up over 200,000 today. I was trying to get actual data on that and couldn't. Western International University, which I remember started back when I was in Denver, in Colorado, so 
sometime in the middle 90s has an enrollment, had an enrollment in 2005 of 51,000 and probably even more now. Um, so what, what's with for-profit universities? And I've had conversations this week because of the Homeland Security Center um, we have at Rutgers on, with American Military University. I don't know if anybody has heard of American Military University, but it's a university that actually has probably 400,000 students. The 117,000 at the University of Phoenix is full-time equivalents. AMU doesn't give it in full-time equivalents. So you have military who go on the GI Bill of Rights. You have military who are taking courses. It is a fully online university. 100% AMU is online. So in conversations with them even this week, why do students enroll with you rather than um, at their local state university? You know, Texas, many military end up getting out of the military and living in Texas, and Texas has community colleges and state colleges and so forth. And of course, they have their own answers for why they do it. But, and they probably vary from person to person. In many cases, for active military, they want the online situation, period. I mean, they can't. They don't know where they're going to be based tomorrow, so they need something that is completely open, transparent, online. Others get used to that when they're taking courses. But this rapid expansion of for-profit universities is huge. And I used to think that the cost of tuition would make it prohibitive. The cost of tuition at AMU is $250 a credit. $250 when you do the multiplication, that's 750 for a three credit course, is not that onerous compared to even public university costs today. So they can go cheaper than they could to a public university. In many cases, they can go cheaper than they can to a community college. Because they have all these kinds of systems that the 250 can become 100. You know, they use the GI Bill, they use, all, you know, if they are former military, they get a reduction. If they're this, they get a reduction. If they get that, they get financial aid from the federal government. Abound. So that's clearly a demographic change that is going to make a huge difference as regular on campus universities move forward. And we'll say more about this as we go along. But it makes the online option that much more important on college campuses. Because you'll lose your enrollment to these other guys. And I'm not convinced, and AMU would not let me go on one of their courses. We've been tempted to sign up as dummies, but that's all right. It'd be worth the investment. Because do I, you know, is it rigorous? Or do I just go through and do everything and then I magically get my pretty good grade at the end of the semester? I don't know. You know, there's no real quality control. Phoenix is at least accredited, so they have to go through the evaluations and stuff, but a lot of them are not. Gender, ethnicity, race have changed rather dramatically. Uh, and I'll as you will see from this particular set of charts, and this is a comparison between 1970 and 2005. Look at the difference between men and women. <laughs> I mean, back when I went to college, there were very few women, and certainly virtually no women in math and science. But, and now you have more women than you have men. In terms of uh, ethnicity, that's changed rather dramatically. Okay. Similarly, the age difference has changed so that, that those pie charts indicate we're serving a different population. The other part that has created an interesting shift, and I've seen this more, you could date it really with 2010, 
is there's much more emphasis on career relevant education. And that's coming out of the federal government. It's coming out of parents who are paying high tuitions and wanting their children to at least have a job when they get out. And as we know, getting jobs the last few years has been really hard. And so schools of any type, from Harvard on down to community colleges, when they can indicate the success of their students in getting jobs because of what they took on your campus, are golden and will be top choices. And you will see more internships and things like that, but it's more the actual character of what is taught in courses and its relevance to what you might be doing later on. So even in English writing class, being able to say is, I teach a history of math class which satisfies the upper division writing requirement at Rutgers, which they have. And it's the only math or science course that does, so I get a lot of students from all over. And I tell, you know, they are taking it to satisfy the writing requirement they don't want to write, they say, math students who've never really had to. And I have told them stories of students that I've had and that have said, you know, I went to a job interview and they insisted on a writing sample. Or they insist on a writing sample before they'll even invite me for a job interview. All right. And one student came back, he says, you told me that in class and I didn't believe you. But I took my paper along just in case and they wanted it. <laughs> so, or the student I ju that just got a job with ESPN in Connecticut in their master analytics uh, complex there. And he had asked last spring if I would write him a letter of recommendation and I wrote him a very strong letter because he, his paper was on sabermetrics, which is really the data metrics. Uh, if you've seen Moneyball or read the book, you know what it is, but of uh, baseball and understanding how to put out a team that's going to win, in essence. And he had taken and developed his own metrics besides talking about the ones, the standard ones. But he wrote enormously well. And so when I wrote his letter of recommendation, I said that. So the head of, the, of ESPN, analytics division called and said, did you really mean what you said in your letter? <laughs> yeah, I always mean what I say. <laughs> I said, yes, and I'll even be stronger. You should be recruiting Michael in the way that NFL teams recruit quarterbacks. <laughs> because he not only has the math background and the analytical skill, he can write, <laughs> you know. So, but I mean, it's those kinds of things that are have becoming so much more important today than they ever were before for any major, for any major. So what does all that mean? Well, it means a, a number of things for us on university campuses, some of which we should have known for a long time but have failed to react to in general. And that's not, you know, it's not a, true of everybody because there are always the ones who who try at least to do things differently but we've known that students children adults have different learning styles the Howard Gardner work in the early 80s out of Harvard and that some people are visual learners some people are auditory learners some people are hands-on learners he had these eight different learning styles and there's been a great deal of discussion about it primarily at in, for elementary school children and making sure that young children learn using their best ways of learning. We're paying more attention to it in colleges now. It's not simply, you know, the sage on the stage, take it however you can and so forth. One funny story that way. When I was in college, I had to take Psych 101, 102. A lot of you probably did. And remember, this was, this was probably 1959, 60. It was the most awful course. <laughs> because basically the professor stood up there and read what was in the book. And then the test was these minuscule headings under pictures or something like that, a multiple choice test. I knitted two sweaters each semester. <laughs> 
And I think, if your students knitted in your class, <laughs> you'd be absolutely chagrined. <laughs> but that was the only way you got through these big lectures. And my position at Harvard, when I was visiting professor at Harvard in the 80s, was as professor of psychology. I mean, it was visiting professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology and Social Relations, because my research at the time was in math psych. I have a card to prove it, you know, plastic card, Harvard faculty with my title. I still think in mathematics, with one year of college math, there's no way you could be a faculty member in mathematics. <laughs> but I don't, they never asked <laughs> how much psychology background I had, <laughs> or the product of my psychology background, namely four sweaters. <laughs> so, so I mean, things have changed. Things have changed dramatically. And in addressing different learning styles now, one of the ways that we can do it that makes it possible for us to do it is the options available. We have online courses. We have people who are interested in instructional technology, like John and his crew, who worry about making quality online courses, etc. We have blended courses for those that don't want solely online courses. We have video classes. We have flipped classes classrooms, whatever. Um, we have project-based, self-guided. The choices abound. And that makes for interesting challenges, as I will say in a minute, because how do you decide what to do? How do you decide what is effective? And as I said, we'll say a little more about that in a minute. But most importantly today, and some of it's been motivated by um, you know, regional evaluation, middle states evaluation, southern states evaluation programs. Some of it has been through engineering and ABET accreditation programs and so forth. But we've been forced to think about what learning outcomes we want to achieve in our classes. And I'll admit, when I first started teaching in college, I didn't think about the learning outcomes. I was teaching say abstract algebra, they had to learn groups, rings, fields. You know. They had to learn about silo groups and you know, you had this list of things that they were supposed to take away in terms of knowledge. But one thing the standards movement in K-12 education did is it put an emphasis on what children should know and be able to do. So it isn't just the knowing, it's the able to do part of it as well. And so that has penetrated college classrooms. It still is not as imperative as it tends to be in high schools these days or K-12 schools, but it's there. But in the process of understanding learning outcomes, trying to determine appropriate assessments to determine if those learning outcomes have been met. You know, in some sense, that history of math class, one learning outcome was that they learned to write. So they have to write two papers, and the papers are graded and with an eye towards improvement and everything else. So, But there's an emphasis on active learning. There are cross-disciplinary options. I was on the plane yesterday out of Philadelphia with a professor of biology at UPenn and she said, it used to be I could teach biology. And that's all I had to worry about. And she says, now there's so much interface with biology and physics, biology and mathematics, that I'm having to learn the rudiments of computational biology, which is more mathematics, for my basic biology classes. And we have one of our big projects at Rutgers that has been funded by NSF for now, we're going into our 11th year and final year, is a biomath project of developing modules for high school students that integrate biology and mathematics. These are drop-in modules. Well, they start out being drop-in modules. And 
they are often in taught, team taught by a biology teacher and a math teacher. And we had so many of our teacher, initial teachers say, I never even knew who the biology teacher was in my high school. And so the students are becoming exposed to various computational biology techniques and ideas, ecological um, techniques that are both mathematical and, and biological and so forth in high school. And they're going to college and asking for similar kinds of things in college. But, as I said, these were going to be drop-in modules, but then the teachers and the schools they were used in wanted full semester or full year courses. Every school in the state of North Dakota this year offers a biomath senior level full year course. Team taught by a math teacher and a biology teacher. That's remarkable. In fact, they experimented with it last year in about five schools. <laughs> and we said, help, we haven't put it together as a, you know, as a book. <laughs> We've got our module. No, no, you've got to put it together, and you've got to put it together even though it's all available electronically. We've got to have paper to give to the State Board of Ed. So we created, you know, printed out all this stuff, gave them a stack that high of paper. That was the book. It discouraged them from probably reading it at all. So, but it got approved, and as I said, every high school in the state of North Dakota is offering it this starting this fall. So um, we've had similar successes with our computational thinking modules, which are sort of a prelude to a computer science kind of course. So, but it's all interdisciplinary, and it's all and there's a craving for interdisciplinary education. So you, as college faculty, are going to see kids coming from high school who had these experiences. But you're also going to find as you move forward, as the professor from Penn said, you know, biology is no longer just biology, no matter really what field you're in or area of biology you're in. And that can be said of any of them at the same time. The, again, I'm mentioning uh, the career relevant education, but the advent of new technologies has made so many different things possible. You can create huge learning communities that are not only local, they're national, they're international. And there have been many interesting examples of learning communities that are made possible because of online course development. And it, they weren't started to become international. They just became international. You have huge citizen science projects, um, some not very far away from here, where adults and children can participate in real scientific research. There's an enormously large, awesome project at Montana State University. Um, in weeds, believe it or not. <laughs> and has found that there are many more species of weeds than anybody ever thought there were, but has created you know, large databases of information for others who are doing research. But it has engaged the community as well as, as children uh, of all ages at the same time. All right. What can you do? What can we do? Well, one of the bits of information that is well documented now is that the best predictors of success are entering college immediately. And that sounds like it is contrary to having non-traditional students. It may be in the sense, but you, the ideal in a way is a group of students who come out of high school prepared to go to college, go to college. And then you also have the non-traditional students that want to increase their education in one form or another. And the other part of it is taking a high school curriculum that stresses reading at grade level and math besides college algebra. And many of you look at me and probably say, but reading at, reading at grade level is part of getting out of high school. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Um, reading is important. 
in kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third grade and fourth grade. But to a large extent, reading is ignored in high school. And students complain that the SATs have these reading parts. <laughs> but if you have high school students, kids, ask them if they do any critical reading <laughs> in their high school English class. Now they might read Shakespeare and then they're told to t write about it, talk about it, you know. What was Shakespeare really trying to say or Hamlet trying to say or whatever. But that's not reading for college level content courses. And, and so it, the hope is with the common course standards in both math and language arts and the next generation science standards all emphasizing reading technical and, and non-technical work that this can change but that becomes critical and is not too surprising the students who come from the rural most rural and the most urban settings are the ones where reading is lacking the most that doesn't say everyone, but it says that those students have not had the opportunities that other students have had. So it's important to work with the high schools nearby and even work with high schools be beyond. But most importantly is look at the needs and the circumstances of the students you have in your own classes. Uh, it isn't sufficient to simply assume they're all the same. In other words, if students are having problems reading, give them more to read and take the time to discuss it. Uh, with the history of math, I find each semester, and these are senior math majors, I have to basically remind them <laughs> how they have to read anything that is mathematical at all, but e and it, course passes over because if you ask them what they do for reading in their English class or history oh we skim it and and those of you who are math people know in a math problem there is nothing there that is unimportant <laughs> and so I make them underline and do stupid things like that that you would think they should be beyond but they appreciate it because reading for what is the essence is important and sometimes underlying at least reminds them when they try to do the problem because part of that history of math they have to do solve the problem the way the tool using only the tool so if we're doing Babylonian mathematics they don't can't use a calculator <laughs> they don't have any algebra or things like that it was only geometric kinds of things in those days so so it, it it's important to be sure um, you understand the students. One of the reasons I like teaching online, and I teach an online calculus for business majors, and the students are primarily policemen and ones that work in the casinos. I live in New Jersey, not far from Atlantic City. And these people have to take online courses because no way are their schedules fixed enough so they can come to campus and take the classes. And you know you get the students who are single mothers with five kids and their mother dies in the middle of the semester <laughs> and she was the one that helped with the kids. I know my students probably better in my online class because they will tell me where they're coming from and so eliciting some of the background is critical for helping them get through a particular course, particularly calculus. So. But being open to new ways of teaching, project-based learning with the corresponding assessments, introduction of research questions into classes. I've begun to do that in my classes in general, and I do a lot of writing, so I've written more textbooks and chapters lately. Um, one of the advantages of research questions is that they come to it with more of an open mind but that for the first time many students understand that you don't know all the answers 
Nobody knows all the answers. I had an argument with an editor on a chapter in a book that's designed for modern students of modern biology courses. And she said, but you don't have the solutions to all the exercise. They want a separate solutions manual to go with it. I said, no. I said, <laughs> I said these are open-ended questions. And I'm not sure anybody knows the answer, but it's worth thinking about the question. And so that I wrote more about this is the intent of some of those questions. But not knowing all the answers is a good thing. And students understanding that early on, and again, from my math background, they want to know the formula that will produce the exact answer. No, it doesn't work that way anymore. You know, this, especially if you wanted to go on and get a PhD, you, nobody will tell you what it is. So. But the ability to blend formats, you know, you have online classes, you have blended classes which we call back east hybrid classes, uh, where half is online and half is on campus. You have electronic formats like Sakai. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Sakai at all, where it's sort of, it isn't a course management system, but it's a, I don't know, a, a supplement to course system where you can give readings and quizzes and post them online, but there isn't the level of interactivity that you have in an online one, but still gives you the electronic format option. Flipped classrooms to me is quite interesting where, and I'm gonna try it a little bit, a partial flip I guess in my history of math class this semester, where what you use the class time primarily for working problems and you know what traditionally would have been all homework and the homework is watching videos or reading materials you know online posted on Sakai in that case but um, it'll be interesting to see how it works there people are designing apps for phones knowing that everybody has phones I'm the evaluator on a project at the University of Georgia fascinating project to teach calculus using, not exclusively, using smartphone apps. The results are quite remarkable. <laughs> and I don't know that I believe them, so I'm going down to University of Georgia this fall. I want to see it in person and how they're doing it. And, but it's, and it's interesting because the apps come in different versions. Basic calculus requires, you know, a whole bunch of different kinds of things but and has applications so one of the apps on the telephone is um, is to design robots and to under you know you can do almost anything on your phone which is scary but um, is to design robots and to design the robots to do different things is really basic freshman first semester calculus required and so can they learn how to do it in that kind of a setting? And of course, practice it will. <laughs> Probably their English class, no. Um, and then transfer the knowledge to other settings. Because cognitive transfer is also a term that is becoming Im increasingly important in all education, whether it be at the K-12 or the college level. Is We've all seen students where you think they learned this and then they come to your class and they look at you as if they never saw it before. Calculus being one of those things, but others the same way. And so what is the cognitive transfer? But you're going to see a lot of different things going on. You're gonna see um, people developing online tools, people developing apps for smartphones, and so forth. So my last, part of all of that is be part of some of these experiments. First of all, NSF funds a lot of it, and not just in STEM education, science, math, technology education. Because, for example, they want to fund right now, how do you incorporate some of the new language arts standards that talk about technology and 
technical writing and things like that. And so they need to bring groups of people together from a lot of disciplines. Same thing is true with, with the undergraduate curriculum. Be part of them. Um, the University of Georgia is looking for schools to try out a freshman calculus, you know, calculus class using, they're doing their own field testing right at the moment locally, but then they want schools elsewhere. Our big projects, the ones that, the biomath and so forth, have teachers all over the country. We don't have any teachers in Utah, so if you know any high school teachers you think would be useful, interested in such things in Utah, let me know. Because some, most of our contacts come from faculty like you who know this teacher at this school. Because we have a harder time getting into high schools to find them, you know, cold. So get involved. Um, one of the things I have started to create is sort of a listserv where I send out ways of getting involved. And so uh, if you'd like to be on that list, sir. Um, I mean, you, know, you can read them when they come, and I promise not to do it more than once, probably every two weeks. But it'll give you an opportunity to see what's out there and what you can do. One of the things I thought I would do is, and many of you are going to float between some of these breakout sessions, but I'm going to hang out here. If anybody wants to have a cup of coffee and have conversation about anything I've talked about, um, just come by. If you want to leave me your email address, please do. Leave me your depart, you know, just say your name, your department, and your email address, <laughs> just so I have some idea of what your background is. But one of the reasons I fail miserably at retiring is this is a damned exciting time to be teaching in higher ed and to be working in K-12 schools, high schools particularly is what I do. I can't give that up. I like them too much. And I like to see children learn. And one of the, my pet peeves, and I don't care whether you're a liberal or a conservative or whatever, is I fully believed in the statement of, that George Bush made of No Child Left Behind. The problem is the execution of it nationally was flawed. Again, regardless of what side of the coin you happen to be on. But we cannot forget those words. We can't say that was wrong, it wasn't. And we can't say no student in higher ed should be left behind because of something we didn't do and facilitate it. Because these are our next generation. They're the ones that as we <clears throat> get really old and too many baby boomers and try and develop public policy and so forth, they're the ones who are going to be voting, <laughs> you know, to deep six us someplace <laughs> or whatever happens. So uh, enjoy, enjoy the beginning of the semester. It's hard to believe the summer's almost over. And thank you again for having me. It's been fun. Any questions immediately?